Okay, very good. So tonight's concert is a concert that's largely Hebrew music. The main works are Leonard Bernstein's Chichester Psalm and three movements from the Friday evening service of Paolo Ben Hai. In addition, there are a number of shorter works to round out the evening. I believe we have a wonderful, wonderful mix of concert material. Chichester Psalm remains for much of the choral world its principal, if not sole, encounter with Hebrew choral music. Indeed, for the hundreds of amateur as well as professional and university choruses throughout the world that have delighted in singing this work during the past four decades, and for non-Jews among audiences from America, Europe, and the British Isles to the Far East, Chichester Psalms has often constituted their exclusive experience with the Hebrew language. These words by Neil Levin, who is the uh, arranger and the, uh, and the uh, composer who supervised a massive undertaking called the Milken Library of Jewish Music, uh, these are wrote, words that he wrote about Chichester Song. It not only is probably the most frequently performed concert work by Leonard Bernstein, the first time it was performed was in July, on July 15th of 1965, 50 years ago, but it's also the most popular and maybe the only Hebrew work which is popularly performed in the United States and throughout the world. It was commissioned by Walter Hussey, who was the dean, that's like the rector or the chief poncho or the archbishop, not the archbishop, whatever the title is, of Chichester Cathedral in England. Uh, Hussey lived from 1909 to 1985, and together with his organist and conductor, John Birch, thought it would be great to reach out to Bernstein to compose this piece. Hudson was a patron of the arts and had commissioned works by Henry Moore and Mark Chagall in terms of artistry, statue and uh, uh, window, uh, stained glass windows, and Benjamin Britten, the famous British composer of modern music. He wanted to make sure that there was a breath of fresh air in what might otherwise be a staid and Stagnant Anglican tradition in Britain. <clears throat> Bernstein had had a sabbatical from the New York Philharmonic, and he spent most of that time working on a, a stage uh, musical. The Skin of Our Teeth, Fourth and Wilder, the musical had most of the music written for it, but never took off. By December, maybe possibly as late as February of the sabbatical year, he realized that he had the commission for the Chichester uh, Cathedral, and the skin of our teeth was not going to happen, and he sat down to work on the piece for Chichester. At one point, he thought he would call it, call it Psalms of Youth. He later changed it to Chichester Psalms because he thought that it would be too complicated for a youth choir to perform. Bernstein had gone through a period of time in which always cognizant of his Jewish tradition, he, one of his earliest pieces was the setting of Hashki Vega for Park Avenue Synagogue, and he had worked with the Israel Philharmonic for many, many years prior to this time. But he went through a period of time in which he had an intense working on Jewish themes in his performance life. One of the most important performances of the Bloch Sacred Service was in 1960. It angered the composer's widow and family because he made it more Jewish than it had, depend, uh, that it had been intended to be, at least according to them. Bloch had started with a setting of the, uh, the basic Jewish service as it was performed from the Union Prayer Book, but over his life had come to see this as his major mass a work that was about brotherhood and, although it was Hebrew from the Jewish tradition, would be universal. Bernstein had Rabbi Judah Kahn uh, in tone, in rabbinic tones, speaking like a sermon, the words about brotherhood, and had the actual Kaddish perform. He also had performed and written his first symphony, which was about Jeremiah, which had had a piece of Lamentations performed in Hebrew, and most importantly, for our uh, purposes, his third symphony was performed in 1963, the Cottage Symphony. 
This symphony is a very, very difficult work. Its major section is called Dean Torah and calls God to task for everything that had gone wrong. One could say that Bernstein worked this all out of his system with the Chichester Psalms, which has some of the agony and the conflict built into the work, but also comes at the end with a very peaceful and serene a cappella section saying how good and wonderful it is that brothers will dwell together. Amen. This is also a time of great ferment in the United States and throughout the world both in the area of, many of you will remember, the social upheavals and the Vietnam War in the 1960s, the assassination of Jack Kennedy, who was a friend that invited Bernstein to the White House, uh, the murder of Mark Blitzstein, who was the uh, librettist who wrote the English libretto for the Free Penny Opera, also a close friend. <clears throat> it was a time of civil rights movement, and in the Jewish Christian world, it was also a time of ferment in the field of Jewish Christian relations. Nostra Aetate, the very important papal pronouncement of Pope Paul VI, would not yet have been pronounced, but everybody was aware that Vatican II had been meeting for several years on the initiative of Pope John XXIII, and their announcement, which was a sea change in how the Catholic Church looked at Islam and Judaism and other non-Catholic religions. That was to come out in November. Also, uh, Bernstein would not have been aware of this, although it's part of the feeling in those times. Uh, Abraham, Yoshua Heschel, Abraham Joshua Heschel was invited to speak at Union Theological Seminary. Heschel taught at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Union Seminary was a liberal Protestant seminary, basically across the street. And his speech, No Religion is an Island, also is an important milestone in Jewish-Christian relations. So one could say that it is mostly Walter Hussey's commitment to art and to that which was popular, which drove his request to ask Bernstein to, commission, uh, to write the piece for him, but it reflected also the spirit of the times. Hussey had met Bernstein at a concert in New York and had a lovely time talking to him and thought it would be useful to have it. And he said to Bernstein, you know, it should be something that is appropriate for the summer festival that they have. And in 1965, it was the turn of Chichester Cathedral. There were two other cathedrals that worked together. But it should be jazzy, something of the spirit of uh, West Side Story. And he also suggested there would be a line from Psalm, maybe Psalm 2, why do the nations gather together? Hussey got a lot more than he thought he would from this line. There are three movements of the Chichester Psalms. The first one opens with a very, very dramatic discordant note, and Ura Hanevel arrives, the harp, and it sets the, uh, the, the, the tone, I'll read you part of the translation. I don't know if this is the same translation as the one in your programs. Awake, psaltery, and harp, I will rouse the dawn. And then goes on to a very likely choice, both in Christian and in Jewish traditions. Psalm 100 is the psalm of thanksgiving. Uh, Mizmor Toda, the uh, song of thanksgiving. Jewish tradition says that this was recited in the temple at the time when people made offerings to the temple, giving thanks for particularly good things that happened uh, to them. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. A text that would have been very familiar to everybody. Some people have talked about Bernstein as a numerologist and have talked about the fact that he has discordant sevens. Uh, that's like somewhere there, oh, that thing. And also has the beat of seven. Beat of seven is da 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 seven beats. Two, two, three. Back in mathematics when I was a kid, two plus two plus three equals seven. And he has this notion of seven to drive this uh, movement forward with a tremendous amount of energy. The second movement, the middle movement, is entitled David and the Shepherds. And the first part of it has a boy soprano, a boy singer, 
who sings the very famous Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, in Hebrew. And everything is peaceful, and the shepherds join in with him. And David, of course, his favorite instrument was the harp, and you'll hear the harp go along with it. But then trouble breaks out, and you hear, Lama Radishu, Lama Radishu Bayim, why do the nations gather together? As a very, again, discordant note, a note of trouble. The sopranos and altos fight against the tenors and basses. By the end, what you hear is young King David singing the end of Psalm 23. But the final musical notes show that this tension is not resolved. The third movement begins with a prelude. The prelude brings together a number of the musical motifs from part one and part two. And they fight it out in the piano. They fight it out and they think we're having piano, uh, percussion, and harp. I think the harp has a few lines as well as the piano. So you'll hear some of the motifs from part one and part two fighting each other until very cl to close to the end they begin to resolve into a peaceful lullaby. In the lullaby, the choir sings a part of Psalm 131, and I'll read you part of the translation. Lord, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or things too wonderful to me, for me to understand. I think the idea of this psalm comes to a head both in the psalm and in the singing of the psalm, in Chichester Psalms. My soul is even as a weaned child, a child that is weaned of its mother, but the Hebrew, aleimo, upon its mother. And the image the psalmist seems to give us is a child who is resting peacefully, having drunk all the milk that he wants or she wants, resting peacefully, on the breast of its mother as a young child with a soul that's completely at rest. And the music that comes after that indicates that peacefulness. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. And it's only at that point that the music cuts out to a cappella without orchestral, that means no orchestral accompaniment. And we hear Behold how wonderful it is that brethren will dwell together. Amen. The notes that I've been looking at said Bernstein, especially in the early part of his career, idolized Gustav Mahler. And the idea of ending with the main point of the music coming with an a cappella section was an idea he lifted from Mahler. But that wasn't the only thing that he lifted from Mahler. Most that's in section three. A cappella means no orchestra. Okay, so the a cappella section at the end of part three of the Chichester Psalm, the theme was not borrowed from Mahler, but the idea of having the main point of the entire piece is the point. I didn't make this up. I have no idea whether it's right. But Paul Laird and some of the other people I wrote, I read said. This is an idea that was inspired by Gustav Mahler in the resurrection system. Go listen to it, see whether he's right, or see whether I understood even what Paul Laird said. But that was, the music was not borrowed from Mahler. The music, though, was borrowed from West Side Story and from the Thornton Wilder piece that never got off the ground. The middle section is almost entirely cut from stuff that never made the stage. The young King David sings the song, Spring Will Come, in a part of the wilder piece where everybody is worried that it's going to be winter forever. The first chord is very wintry, and then the soloist sings, Spring Will Come, don't be worried, things are going to get better. This became the Psalm 23, The Lord is My Shepherd. The other movement is from the opening song of West Side Story when it first began to rehearse. In Chichester Psalms, the tenors and the basses say, Va, ma, 
Lama, Lama Ragashu, here are the original words. Mix, mix, make a, mess, make a mess of them. Pay the Puerto Rican fact, make a mess of them. If you let us take a crack, there'll be less of them, there'll be less of them. Mix, we can cut them up. If you only say the word, we can cut them up. Go ahead and say the word, and we'll shut them up, we can shut them up. It was done as fast as that, and nobody understood the lyrics, and it was very complicated because the musical arrangement was really not easy to hear on the Broadway stage. Instead, they had the opening jet song that we have today. The first section also has stuff that was cut from uh, the Wilder musical that never happened. Bernstein worked very hard on it. He worked with Condon and Green, uh, very famous lyricists. And he worked also with other people and reused some of that material. And he also used material from something that he called the War Duet, a piece that he had written back in the 1940s when World War II was going on and never used either. Now, there are a few more things that I want to uh, mention very briefly about the Chichester Psalms, but I'm going to read part of a poem that, Chichester, that Bernstein wrote. From hours on end I brooded and mused, on materiae musicae used and abused, on aspects of unconventionality, over the death in our time of tonality, pieces for nattering, clucking sopranos, with squadrons of vibraphones, fleets of pianos, played with the forearms, the fists, and the palms, and then I came up with Chichester songs. <laughs> My youngest child, old-fashioned and sweet, and he stands on his own two-tonal feet. These psalms are a simple and modest affair, tonal and tuneful and somewhat square, certain to sicken a stout John Cater with its tonics and triads in B-flat major. <laughs> well, a very interesting poem, and for many people in this room, Chichester Psalms will not sound as tonal as all that. It won't sound as uniformly tonal as, say, our final theme, John Butters, May the Lord Bless You and Keep You. It won't sound like Broadway music, uh, Broadway show tunes, because it has tritones, it has sevenths, it has uh, very, very jarring notes. But what was going on at the same time was serial music, 12 tone uh, pieces, Schoenberg, and so on, and compared to that, Bernstein was very convinced that this was very much within the tonal tradition. I'd like to turn now to the Kabbalat Shabbat, the uh, other major work that we have. Kabbalat Shabbat is much longer than the Chichester uh, Psalms. The Chichester Psalms is about 18 minutes. Kabbalat Shabbat worried to do the whole thing, and I frankly hope the Hebrew crowd does do the whole thing at some point in the future. It would be about 40 to 50, 40 to 50 minutes, maybe even a little bit longer. It is a full setting of the Friday evening service as it was envisioned in the Union Prayer Book in the 1960s. Its composer is Paul Ben Hayim, who was born Paul Frankenberger and lived near Munich for the first part of his life. He was born in 1897, and by 1933, he already had something of a career. Actually, by 1932, he had already had something of a career. Two things happened. He lost his job in Augsburg, and the Nazis were elected. Uh, he decided it was time to check out whether or not he would be able to survive in Palestine in those days. He had a number of friends, Heinrich Shalit, <coughs> a well-known composer of synagogue music, had suggested to him that Palestine might be the place to go. Frankenberger went to Palestine, he got a visa in Munich, and on the ship he met a violinist who had a couple of gigs and needed a pianist. Frankenberger's visa did not allow him to perform in public or to accept uh, paying gigs. So his agent said, what's your dad's name, Heinrich? So now you're going to be Paul Ben Chaim. And the name was his performance name for the rest of his life. Ben Chaim is something of the dean of an Israeli school of performance. He studied with some of the greats in Germany, and he studied still with some of the earliest 
representatives of the Palestinian musical scene. He taught in Jerusalem, he taught in Tel Aviv. In 1933, he wrote his dad, he wasn't sure what was going to happen to music in Palestine, but the Nazis were not particularly happy to have Jews perform, and there was a possibility, it was called in Hebrew Ha'avara, transfer. There was a possibility of many Jews going from Nazi Germany, the National Socialist uh, uh, Reich, to Palestine. Uh, something like 70,000, some enormous number of Jews uh, went to Palestine. Many of them were very com uh, competent musicians. By the 19, middle of the 1930s, uh, Huberman had organized the Palestinian Symphony Orchestra, the ancestor of the Israel uh, Philharmonic. They performed in Tel Aviv and in Cairo. In those days, you could do that. And uh, the rest is history. In any case, Ben Chaim did orchestral works, piano works, and vocal works, and worked with a woman named Rachat Kafira, who was born in 1910 and died in 1990. He wrote cantatas, he wrote biblical themes. His earliest cantatas had very little Jewish material in them, and they may have had a biblical title, but they were done all in German. Rachat Zafira liked Mediterranean music. She fused Yemenite and European and Iraqi and all the other traditions that were floating around in Palestine of those days. Ben Chaim is often considered to be one of the founding pegs of a kind of Eastern Mediterranean school, which is basically like Central European music but has some of the Jewish motifs. You'll hear once or twice in the uh, uh, Friday night service a little bit that sounds like the, the uh, Havana Gila mode. Da, 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 da. You won't hear much of it. And you'll also hear material that sounds like it comes from the Arabic world. In 1966, NIFTI, the National Found uh, Federation of Temple Youth, invited him to be, the, well, I should say, in 1966, he was sent as a delegate from Israel to the Nifty camp, which had invited the Israelis to send over a composer and a musician, both to introduce young reformed Jews to Israeli music and to introduce Israeli musicians to the American Jewish uh, world. He began composing <coughs> the Friday night service at that time, and its first performance was in May of 1968 to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the State of Israel, performed by the New York Philharmonic. Neil Levin, whom I quoted before, points out that there are a number of departures from the traditional Kabbalat Shabbat in this service. Uh, they should be familiar to those who know something about the Reformed Jewish prayer book. He has only one of the psalms that come on Friday evening, Psalm 98. He has the candle lighting ceremony done in a gorgeous rendition, all by women, because traditionally women like the Sabbath candles. However, in Reformed synagogues, this is done in the synagogue. In traditional congregations, this is done at home. Our last movement from the Friday night service is the Lechad Odin, and Ben Chaim set the stanzas of the poem that are typically recited in the Reform community. So instead of having about a dozen stanzas, they have three stanzas. The second one, one in the middle, Hidora reads, Arise, Awake, and the last one, Boim Shalom, Come in Peace. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the texts and say, one final word about the Hebrew material, then I'm going to go on to the other parts of the concert. Bernstein took pre-existing music and psalms and put them together. I think the result is phenomenal. However, accent is not always on the right salaf. Levin, again, writing about Hatikva, talks about the famous hymn of the what uh, the hymn of the state of Israel 
also has the same problem. If you analyze the way it's sung, it's not really modern Hebrew accent, and it's not really Eastern European accent. It's somewhere in between. The pre-existing pre melody was... I'm sorry, the words were put on the accent to the pre-existing melody. In Chichester Psalms, Bernstein has a full psalm and part of another psalm in each section and repeat some of the words over and over again in a way which is not really consistent with traditional Jewish chanting, but serves to emphasize some of the ideas. In part three, it emphasizes the idea of peacefulness, although the last psalm, the last piece, behold how good it is for brothers to dwell together, is done without a break and without a repeat. Sometimes the accents, I think, build up energy and excitement for people who are interested. One other thing about the psalm, in our program, I believe, and certainly in the text of the Chichester Psalms, one of the things which is very much Anglican is the enumeration. One of the ways in which Hebrew Bibles and Anglican Bibles, TJ Bibles differ, is that most Hebrew Bibles have Mizmor le David, a psalm of David, as verse 1. And the next one is verse 2. Here, you leave out Ms. Borla David, the Psalm of David, and verse 1 is considered to be, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, I'm going to uh, go on then straight to talk about the other things in the program. The rest of the program has a piece in Yiddish and a piece in Ladino. The Yiddish piece is very famous. You all probably heard it. Um, if, you, if you haven't heard it, it's you know, very uh, unfortunate. Charles Secunda died in 1974. He was the, probably the most important American composer on the Yiddish stage. In addition to the piece we will be performing for you, he also wrote Dona Dona, and he wrote the music for any number of Second Avenue musicals on the Yiddish stage, and for many years, he wrote the music for uh, Richard Tucker in the Catskills for the High Holidays and for Passover. This song went nowhere, probably was a great star on Second Avenue, the reason we know about it today is three ladies, Laverne, Maxine, and Patty. Do you know what I'm talking about? They sang in 1937, they recorded it on Decca, and my wife likes to say it's been a hit ever since. The other example of traditional Jewish music is in Ladino. Ladino is traditional Spanish, as spoken by Jews in the areas in which Spanish Jews left and when they left Spain after 1492 with the expulsion that was decreed by Fernando and Isabel. No one knows where Adio Corrida actually came from and who first sang it. However, there's an interesting story. Some people say Giuseppe Verdi, yes, that Verdi, had a patron who was a Sephardic Jew and taught Verdi the melody, which he then used in La Traviata, where Violetta sings this just before she's about to die. Adio del passato, goodbye, goodbye. I live my life as good as I can, as well as I can. Uh, <coughs> Adio del passato. If you know the opera, it's a very famous uh, piece. Some of the people who are Ladino fans know about the Verdi ascription, but think that it's the drinking song from part one, which doesn't sound at all like our piece. A couple of years back, a lady named Cohen Serrano wrote that in fact this was not true. Adio Carida comes from a lady named Julie Cohen in Sofia, Bulgaria, who used to sing sad songs from opera on the street. And this one was the Ladino version that was remade from the song that she sang from Traviata. It's actually very interesting. You have an idea of ancient Spanish Jewish songs that is denied by version two of this legend and replaced with a Verdi uh, background, just to make it more interesting. As I said, no one knows what is really true. Our, 
The remaining three pieces on the program tonight are lots of fun. We have two pieces in Hebrew. They are really concert settings of songs. Uh, Hebrew by Charles Osborne. Osborne. Osborne is a cantor. He became a cantor in 1987. He wrote for youth choirs and for actually any choirs. This piece, uh, I don't remember when it was written, but Osborne is writing in a very traditional but very modern folk singing kind of vein. Benji Ellen Schiller was died uh, was born in 1958, and she is active primarily.